you know, what's interesting in what you're talking about and what I think we should kind of just mention is that it, you, you said it could potentially happen in Ukraine, you know, uh, people have capabilities, these weapons that can be used on the battlefield. Um, can you talk a little bit more about them, what kind of damage they do? Because I, I think this is what people don't understand, right? They they think it's going to be the big one, but really it's it's these smaller ones that can cause a tremendous amount of human and environmental damage and, and psychological damage, all kinds of damage. Um, can you speak a little bit more about that threat and how it might be different than this big one threat that everybody talks about? Sure. <clears throat> so tacti tactical or battlefield nuclear weapons, those are usually low yield weapons. So smaller than the uh, yield of the bombs the US used against Japan in, in uh, World War II against Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So under, you know, normally under 10 to 15 kilotons and shorter range. So the intent, as you say, is to be used against military targets that could be, for example, military airfields or command and control systems, or even, you know, ports that are being used for, you know, military transport or even against military forces. And the, the tactical nuclear weapons have generally been developed by countries that see themselves at a conventional disadvantage against a potential enemy. And they see tactical nuclear weapons as a way to compensate for that conventional disadvantage. So during the Cold War, the US and NATO thought that they were facing you know, much larger, much better armed Warsaw Pact forces that could uh, uh, attack uh, uh, NATO, in particular West Germany, and overwhelm NATO defenses. So during the Cold War, the US uh, uh, developed and deployed hundreds, if not thousands, of these low yield, short range uh, tactical nuclear weapons. It could be delivered by short range rockets or uh, artillery or even uh, uh, backpacks, sort of nuclear landmines. Well, with the end of the Cold War, that balance really shifted, and uh, it was Russia that felt it was a conventional at a conventional disadvantage, and it was the Russians who uh, proceeded to uh, develop and deploy a, a, a large force of tactical nuclear weapons to be used in a conflict with NATO, which the Russians calculated they would likely lose, and they would need to use nuclear weapons to compensate for that weakness. The US still has a small number, a couple of hundred of tactical nuclear weapons based in Europe, but that's really more for political and symbolic value in terms of providing assurances to our NATO allies that we will protect them if there's a war with Russia. So I mentioned Pakistan, India. Pakistan feels it's at a disadvantage. India has much larger uh, conventional forces. And so Pakistan has developed these uh, short range, low yield battlefield weapons to compensate. A lot of people think that North Korea may be planning to do the same thing, because obviously the military balance between the combined US South Korea forces have an overwhelming advantage over North Korea in terms of both conventional and nuclear forces. And the North Koreans have hinted that they might be trying to develop uh, nuclear weapons that could be used early in a conflict, not against cities, but as a way to force a ceasefire before mm. they lose the conventional conflict. And that, that kind of early nuclear use is what has people nervous about escalation. Because at the same time that North Korea, say, would be considering early nuclear use in a conventional conflict in order to bring it to an end, the US and the ROK will be looking at preemption options to try to destroy North Korean nuclear forces before they can be used. And what the theorists worry about is something called crisis instability, that both sides, even though the use of nuclear weapons is fraught with danger, that in a conflict, in a major conflict where there's uncertainty and risk, uh, one side or the other may feel compelled to use nuclear forces first, and that could lead to an escalation. So I think the, the way to avoid that is to avoid war. And once you get into a war, then things become 
you know, much harder to predict and calculate. And, you know, uh, Putin's invasion of Ukraine has been such a shock because it's the first, you know, major war in Europe since World War II. We had all the, the you know, Serbian conflicts that accompanied the uh, collapse of Yugoslavia, but those were civil wars, at least in the beginning. What Russia has done, I think, is really reawakened the concern about uh, military conflict in Europe. And I think it's been very uh, good that the Europeans have responded by uh, committing themselves to increase their conventional forces, increase NATO deployments on the Eastern Front, all of which I think makes war less likely because I think it, it makes it clear to the Russians that uh, if they were to attack vulnerable NATO countries like the Baltic states, uh, that would lead to a war with NATO and Russia sees itself as uh, not as strong as NATO. Uh, 